Heather and Becca. Perfect. Oh my goodness, beautiful video. <laughs> I just, I didn't take a picture out in front of it when I was last there. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Peter. Welcome, General Assembly participants, to London, Ontario, where we've had a hot day and it's a lovely evening. My name is Peter Jedeke. I'm the honorary president of the London Center of the RASC. Peter. And we are here on the most beautiful campus, Western University, host of the 2022 Denier Cup Football Championship. Yay! <laughs> November 26th. Yay! Yay! Yeah. Hume Cronin Memorial Observatory which is a big feature in the history of the London Center. We are here to celebrate our centennial, which is this year. I'm going to turn around and we're gonna go in the building and down the stairs. So this beautiful vestibule with the marble, all of this dates back to the origin of the, of the observatory. Up the stairs, around the corner, a few years ago for the 75th anniversary of the observatory, we put in a whole bunch of posters and things. New lighting has been installed. And our director, Jan Kami, loves this region of the sky, Roa Pucas. And as we turn here, we've got some of our portable displays set up for you this evening. And we're turning, we're in the basement now, although the basement does have a level exit at the back as well. And in the old days, there used to be a machine shop and other kinds of facilities here. We're gonna turn into what we call the black room where our university does demonstrations. We're going into the 1940s period room. And I'm here to introduce you to Mark Toby, who is the observatory curator and a member of the RAC history committee. And he's going to explain to you and talk about the period room here at Cronin Observatory. Thank you very much, Peter. Okay, so we're gonna just switch over here with this camera. Samantha, if I can probably go to a spotlight over to Mark Toby Cronin, that will be- You can see now. both sides of you right now, so I can switch fully over. Oh, there we go. <laughs> How about that? Smooth, thank you to Heather. Uh, well, welcome to the Cronin Observatory uh, here in lovely London, Ontario, and it really is quite lovely and beautifully clear tonight. That's a teaser for uh, coming attractions. But meanwhile, as it is getting dark, I will give you a little tour of our recreation of the observatory director's office as it might have looked on the day that the observatory opened, namely the 25th of October, 1940. One of the things that I learned from um, one of the masters of period room creation is that when you're putting a room like this together, you want to think carefully, not just, oh, this is from, you know, the 1940s, to the 1950s, or, oh, this is from 1940, but you want to think carefully about, yeah, what was the day that this is staged to? If you're going to have a room which is a stand-in for something that happened a long time in the past where you really crank that way back machine back, you know, what is the date? Ideally, what is the time at which that location um, is staged? And so the 25th of October, 1940 was the day on which this observatory opened. And so the Rask London Center is quite a bit older than this observatory, but both the observatory and the Rask London Center came into existence thanks to the same gentleman, namely Professor Harold Reynolds Kingston. And H.R. Uh, Kingston, uh, originally came from a university and a, uh, a center out west. And um, when he was brought to Western in 1921, so he would have started teaching here in the fall term of 1921, um, he already had that taste of what a RASC center was like and um, wasted no time in setting one up here. And so 
Uh, by the January of that year, uh, H.R. Kingston had already given a speech to try and instigate things. And I'll leave it to Peter to tell you a little bit further about that history. But meanwhile, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, some of the fantastic things that were here in the observatory on the day that it opened. Um, and we're just so fortunate still to have here. And one of the star attractions, certainly one of the crowd pleasers, is this Earth Sun Moon system that you see behind me. So the Earth back here, as you can see, and then we have a moon here as rendered in ping pong ball. And uh, the sun over here as uh, rendered in old tin can painted gray. So you can see, ah, yes, the light from the sun is coming very strong out of the forces strong with this one, um, out of that old tin can and shining in the earth. And as you might imagine, this is the kind of thing that's fantastic for demonstrating eclipses. And in fact, right here with the setup that we have, you can see how the moon is casting a shadow on the earth right there. Um, and, uh, it's marvelous because it's geared. So you can see that there's a whole set of machinery here. And so this means that as I turn the armature, the moon orbits around the earth. And you can see here very clearly demonstrated how the moon orbits along a slant, just like this track here that it is designed to go around. And, uh, so the moon is now passing behind the earth, except because the orb is on the slant, it's passing over the earth and we're not getting a lunar eclipse. Um, and uh, it's just proven both its weight in gold and its incredible durability because this mechanism actually predates the observatory. And one of the things that's quite amazing about the history of this particular observatory, I'm just going to put the hat over here. There we go. One of the things that's quite amazing about this particular observatory is that um, this Earth Sun Moon system and many similar teaching models, we, we hypothesized probably originally 30 in all, were all. Uh, created mostly in the observatory by one gentleman who is the fellow that you can see up here behind me. Uh, his name was William Gladstone Colgrove. And William Gladstone, W.G. Colgrove, um, was a, a Renaissance individual of his day. Uh, not only did he make fantastic mechanical models of astronomical phenomena, but he also uh, was a trained lithographer. Uh, he did clay modeling work of a very high caliber. He collected uh, specimens in like a several month long voyage over to the west coast of Canada. Um, he uh, is the only person I know of who produced an autobiography in verse. So he was a very versatile gentleman indeed. And he um, helped Western University to recover the Dresden meteorite, which at that time in 1939 was the uh, largest mass that had ever been recovered in Canada. And so um, partly in recognition of these, of these many achievements, but most especially these extraordinary models that he put together. I mean, as Dale was saying to me beforehand, you got to tell them this guy's a Leonardo. Like it's incredible what it takes to put something like this together. Um, and there's just the sheer fact that that wasn't the only thing that he put together. He made models of the inner solar system, models of the outer solar system, models of Mars and its two moons, models of the Milky Way galaxy. And my favorite, uh, alas lost, was a model um, which was called the Stellar Radiant. So, so you had Sol right here. So here's our star system. And then there were wires extending out of our star system in all directions, um, showing you the locations in three space 
of the hundred nearest stars to Earth. And for a bonus, it was on a mechanism which allowed you to turn it neatly like this. And so you could turn the whole stellar radiant so that the stars would line up to wherever the actual stars were in the sky that night. So you could say, oh, see, see this star here, that's Vega. And so if you just, if you go outside and look at exactly that direction, Vega is what you will see. Amazing, unfortunately lost. So um, what we have, what remains is just a testament to, to just what, um, what amazing sights you would have seen when the observatory first opened and you came in here and there were 30 of these things crowding into a room like this. Really kind of extraordinary. But um, we do have a few of them. And so I'd like to show you uh, just some examples of some of the other things that Colgrove produced. And this is um, another one of his planetariums. We didn't even know this existed until somebody came to the observatory one day and said, my daughter doesn't need this anymore. Would you like it? And um, we didn't know that this is what he was coming with, but we could clearly see when we got it that it says on here, address W.G. Colgrove to Christie Street. Um, amazing. And so you can see here that there's a little light bulb representing the sun and the various planets and wires. And the light bulb would have been hooked up to a dry cell on the back. And that's really interesting because Colgrove was very interested in putting together models that did not require electricity because so many um, classrooms at that time did not have hydropower, uh, especially ones in, in the countryside and so on. And so uh, this is probably an indication of something that he was trying to build that would have been appropriate for a non-electrified school, really quite wonderful. And one of the other amazing things that we didn't know about until relatively recently, and this story begins as, as many wonderful stories do with a closet underneath the stairs, Cronin has one, there is actually a cupboard under the stairs. And um, as it turned out, uh, we cleaned the cupboard one day, maybe for the first time in 30 or 40 years. And what emerged at the very back of the cupboard, well, as soon as we saw this globe, we knew what we had, um, is this model of Mars and Phobos and Deimos. And if you turn the hand crank right here, you'll see that Phobos and Deimos, right, orbit Mars at just the right relative velocity. Fantastic, look at that. And if I just move it up here, you can just get a little sense of that mechanism going down there. Just really, really clever and quality work. Mars and Phobos and Deimos, ladies and gentlemen. And um, I'm just going to pause this for just a second because I'm realizing it's telling me my battery is low. So I'm gonna plug this computer in. Um, and my power supply is over here, so that's why I'm going to repair to this side of the room. And while I'm over here, I will mention that uh, Colgrove received the Chant Medal. So the uh, highest honor at the time of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada uh, for all of these achievements. And um, he remains, Colgrove remains to this day, the only person in, in London, Ontario, uh, ever to receive a chant medal, full stop. Uh, really kind of a testament to, to this kind of extraordinary straddling of, of uh, practical uh, public astronomy and uh, the teaching of astronomy um, and really sweating the details on all of these things because that's another thing that he did uh, in collaboration with H.R. Kingston, the director of the observatory um, and founder of the Lennon Rask uh, Center that I mentioned earlier. So they worked together very closely and they made sure that they got the scientific details right, as well as creating models that, you know, like 80 years later are still working. Really, really quite extraordinary. Okay, I'm plugging in the laptop now so we do not lose the signal. And right, okay, I'll plug in the plug. Um, attempt not to knock anything over while I do that. Done. Okay, there we go. So, um, 
I've got about four minutes left in my presentation and then I'm going to uh, throw things back to uh, Peter. Uh, upstairs is going to tell you a little bit about the, the RASC London Center, but in the immortal words of Steve Jobs, there's one last thing. And this is not a model by W.G. Colgrove. This is dialing the way back machine to the 18th century. So I've got a little something I want to show you here. And um, since this is so informal, we can, we can actually maybe even turn our mics on and, and just do a little show and tell and maybe guessing game here. So I'd invite you, if uh, you are willing to turn your mics on and have a little guess at what I'm about to show you, what you think it might be, uh, this could be fun. So the great thing about having a screen like this is I can show you objects very closely. And this is our mystery object for today. Um, let's just pull that back a little bit and I'll get out of the way so you can see that. All right. So here's the instrument in front of you. Um, you can see that there's a kind of like a round marble plinth here. Okay, round marble plinth. And then uh, some inscriptions down here. So um, what do you think this might be? Do we have any guesses? The noonday gun. Ah, okay, you're very good. So, um, that's gonna one... get a cooler sunfinder. What's that? Sundial. sundial, but it's like something to find the sun. The sundial is, is yeah, that is absolutely the tip, the thing that you would use to set the time, usually set, as you say, to go off at noon. Um, and uh, the sun when it just exactly went through the glass, the burning glass, as they call it, the magnifying glass, um, would uh, heat up that touch hole there with the gunpowder in the cannon. That is a genuine miniature cannon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, turns out actually miniature cannons in the 18th century were a thing. Um, who knew? Uh, but if you needed a signaling device in the 18th century, um, you know, when your experiment was finished or something like that, miniature cannons were there for you. So, so these things are your friends. But yes, essentially, this is an 18th century alarm clock, uh, a wonderful way to start your day with a bang. And um, really one of the treasured and mysterious and interesting things in the observatory because of this inscription that you can see at the bottom, which says, from the collection of John Davis Barnett. And John Davis Barnett, as it turns out, as well as uh, collecting interesting objects like noonday guns, uh, gave 40,000 books to the Western Library System in 1919. So uh, we are very close to his anniversary of that gift. And Western's been celebrating that. And we've been learning back all kinds of amazing things about, about him. Um, and when you come and visit the observatory, we can fill you in more on that story and many, many other stories that we're uh, investigating and, and uh, mysteries, objects that we are pursuing and uh, you know trying to figure out their story. So I will just leave you with that as a teaser. And um, thank you for your attention and throw things over to Peter, who is upstairs in the main classroom, who's going to tell you a little bit about the 100 years of the Rask Women's Center. Thanks, Mark. Th thank you very much, Dr. Mark Toby. Welcome. I am now sitting in the classroom on the main level of the Hume Cronin Memorial Observatory. You might be able to see that's Hume Cronin's portrait over my shoulder there. I've been bowing down to that ever since I started at Western University as a student 50 years ago. And this classroom is where the London Centre holds its meetings nowadays when they are in person. Uh, the university policy here at the present time still requires us to wear masks. We're just taking them off while we're on uh, camera here. And I can imagine that if we didn't have the COVID situation, we would have had some London Centre members sitting here and giving the sort of SpaceX launch cheer every time we say something wonderful about, about the London Centre. I'm going to share my screen. I'm pretty sure I'm allowed to do that. And I'm going to show you a few slides talking about our history. This is our 100th anniversary. So it gives us a chance to um, talk about ourselves. Whoops. 
And uh, just to give you some quick background, of course, the RASC began in 1868 in Toronto, and then in 1903 was granted a charter. So that's uh, when our history as the Royal Astronomical Society Canada started. And in 1906, they kind of recognized that it was necessary to do something to um, participate on a national scale. So we started having centers or sections as they were called at first. The London Center started as the result of an initiative of Harold Reynolds Kingston, who came to Western U around 1919. He uh, grew up in Eastern Ontario, got his PhD at the University of Chicago, and uh, then was in Winnipeg for a few years before coming to Western U. So he was really interested in astronomy and he gave a public lecture at the downtown library, which you see pictured here at the beginning of 1922. Uh, the, it was a lot of fun, everybody enjoyed the talk. A few, few weeks later, some of the folks that were inspired by his talk got together, formed an astronomy club and the astronomy club as such existed only just for a week or two because it was decided to ask RASC to become the London Center and that was, officially approved on February 24th, 1922. That was the date of our uh, official founding. And when we held our next meeting in March of 1922, that was our first meeting as an RASC center. We held our first public lecture event on our first anniversary at the, in January 23. What you see here is a report in the London Free Press newspaper about the lecture that evening, which was given by Clarence Chant, who of course is famous for his role in the RASC leadership. He was at the University of Toronto and probably was Canada's most famous astronomer. And he gave a talk here in London. And of course, later, since we're talking 1923, later he uh, helped establish the David Dunlop Observatory, still Canada's largest operating telescope of any glass type. Um, and it uh, might have also had a role in motivating H.R. Kingston here in London uh, to or arrange for the construction of this building where I'm sitting right now, the Cronin Observatory. And so our partnership with Western certainly goes back right to the very beginning since Kingston was a Western faculty member. He was in mathematics. He wrote mathematics textbooks and so on, and later served as Dean of Continuing Studies, but he was very active in the London Center basically the whole time. He was president of our club the first eight years. Then he served a term as national president. And after that, he was made London Center's first honorary president, and he stayed in that role for some 30 plus years until he passed away in 1963. The next generation in London is represented by William H. Waylau, who was a professional research astronomer and the first who was dedicated to that uh, role here at Western U. His wife, Amelia, was also uh, an astronomer, and the two of them were both on faculty, and they were responsible for kind of looking after the London Center's connection to the university and so on in the 1960s. And then I was gonna say something about the unruly bunch of youngsters who joined the club in the early 1970s and changed the picture of things. But I like to think that wasn't all bad. We've always been very interested in national connections. Of course, the services that the society's head office offers and the things that we publish like the Observer's Handbook and the Journal really important. I've got a page here from the annual report. One of the great things about the annual report, of course, is that it gives each of us as centers an opportunity to tell everyone else what we did for the whole year. And H.R. Kingston, who we've mentioned a couple times now, also wrote a book called The Easy Pocket Guide for Beginners, which is, you know, same kind of thing you would need today when I think of Leo Enright and the Beginner's Observing Guide in the late 1980s and through the 1990s. This was kind of a prequel to all of that. And in fact, I realized that uh, the wonderful folks at the Society Head Office have made it available uh, on the RAC website for download. Of course, we also have other things joining us together with our fellow centers across the country, like the National Newsletter, the Observer's Calendar, which started in the 1990s. And of course, all of this is really glossing over all the wonderful things that we've all done together at things at events and uh, together at the national level. Mark Toby was talking about W.G. Colgrove, who was the Chant Medal winner, the only London Center member to win the Chant Medal. In 1942, Mark introduced his work and his personality and talked about what kind of a con contributor he was here at Cronin Observatory. 
Uh, in 2015, for the 75th anniversary of Cronin Observatory, which I mentioned earlier, we actually got in touch with the gr grandson of W.G. Colgrove and uh, his great grandchildren are in this photo. They visited here at the observatory with Mark. The uh, Chan Medal is shown there at the low in the lower half of the screen. That's they still had it in the family. They still, um, you know, knew how important it was, and they were quite thrilled to hear from us and quite thrilled to be invited back for that uh, for that anniversary. Another London Centre member from the middle period there in the 19, late 40s and in the 1950s, Donald M. Hennigar, who was an amateur telescope maker. That's his picture there in the bottom of this frame. And the telescope that you see there is one of the telescopes that he built. Uh, he built quite a few telescopes and three of them were kept by his family after he passed away. And in 1999, this one, which is a 20 centimeter Newtonian type reflector, uh, was brought back to, donated to the London Centre, thanks to the efforts of Kirby Allguire, who's a friend of the families. And I don't know if Kirby's on our call this evening, but if you're there, Kirby, thanks once more. And in 2022, just a few months ago, Kirby and some of us from London Centre took the uh, Hennigar reflector to the National, to the Society office, where it is now as part of the Dorner Telescope Museum. We've also been quite active and hosting the General Assemblies. In 1979, this was our first major national event. Our motto, zaniness and tradition. I hope we have done our best to uphold that over the years. The three photos you see are supposed to represent kind of the zaniness and tradition that we were pr so proud of here in London. And we were able, we were invited to host again. We invited the, all of you and the society to come visit us. Let us host the GAs in 2001 and in 2016. It's been a source of great, wonderful activity for us here in London. We had our 60th anniversary in 1982, and Bart J. Bach, the well-known astronomer from Arizona who spent many years in Australia, gave a wonderful lecture to us called My 60 Years as a Milky Way Astronomer. At this wonderful event, we had a whole bunch of luminary members of the RSC, such as Peter Millman, Ian Halliday, plus uh, some VIPs from the university were there. It was a great, wonderful evening. And in fact, we had a 75th anniversary banquet when uh, Paul Chodas, who's a uh, asteroid researcher at Jet, Jet Propulsion Laboratory and a native Londoner, came back to give a lecture. That was in 1997. So it fits to talk about it as part of the 1990s here in London. And of course, I can't even think of the 1990s without mentioning Peter Broughton's fantastic history of the, of the society called Looking Up and every center got a page and many of us were profiled in the book and Peter just did what, such a wonderful job of giving all, any member who takes the time now to read that book a great overview of how each center got started and how each center fits in to the national picture. Now, as time went on, of course, there's always been a little bit of um, tension between the management of centers and what uh, centers were told to do by the society office. So more autonomy has kind of kind of grew for the centers in the 1990s. The uh, benefits of cheaper transportation and more reliable telecommunications made it possible for centers to exchange a lot more. I can tell you personally, I certainly feel like we are so much better are connected now. Look at tonight's event, the General Assembly being online compared to 1973 when, you know, as a young student, I could I couldn't even afford to travel to the other centers in southwestern Ontario to visit them. And now we do that kind of routinely. So that's been a huge change. And it's a wonderful thing for all of us. Another, of course, uh, topic that every center is interested in is observing. So we have a site southwest of London, uh, a wildlife management area run by the province of Ontario near the town of Fingal. We were given permission to set up telescopes on a, you know, occasional basis. And then we were invited to build what they of course call a temporary structure. And any of you, who, any of you who've been involved in this kind of thing know, you know, you build the temporary structure so that in theory, you could take it down and get it off the, off the property if you had to. We uh, had the first building is the one that you see there in green. It was, we call it the warm up room. It has a heater in it and so on. And then soon after that, in 2012, we opened OBS one, which is the one in the picture that has the uh, dome slid back, the roof slid back. 
and they built a second one. You can just barely see the space for it behind OBS-1. The OBS-2, of course, is now finished. It was opened in 2013. We had a wonderful barbecue out there with David H. Levy and lots of folks were visiting. And I'm giving credit here to a list of the folks that came to mind as who had contributed so much hard work to this project over the years. I may have missed some of them and I apologize for missing them, but I thank them all. We, uh, Fingal is still a very active site. In fact, I heard this weekend was clear and I heard we had some of our members were out there and basically lost a lot of sleep because of clear skies. Of course, any uh, club contributes at various levels. We've had seven service award winners in London Center. There you see their names. In fact, we get together every now and then to celebrate this. And there's six of the service awards there on a picnic table a few years ago. And uh, there's the service award shown. In fact, I, I also I did want to I wanted to mention the gold medal as well, which is an academic medal. Um, Peter Brown, who's a faculty member here at Western and a London Center member, won the gold medal of the society in 2001. We're really proud of his work, of course, in meteor physics. And uh, naturally, outreach is a very big deal for every one of us across the country. And uh, here are some photos giving you examples of what kind of activities we've done just in the last few years. That doesn't mean we only just started to do this, of course. What it just tells you is that, uh, you know, I haven't had a chance to digitize films from the early days and I'm not sure film digitizing works as well as some of these wonderful photos we can get these days. So that's what outreach has done for us. And I want to give a plug to Dr. Mark Toby, who has a book coming out uh, fairly soon. He's done an awful lot of work on it. It's based on uh, a collection of poetry that was presented to Western's University, Western University's the observatory director, um, H.R. Kingston, in 1945. And we found the manuscript for this with all the poetry collected. And Mark said, what a great thing project this would make to combine it with wonderful artwork and put it into a book. And I'm now going to switch over and if this uh i do have either you just muted yourself by the way there i've run and there i'm unmuted again i'm gonna switch yeah. to the other camera oh you muted yourself again <laughs> yeah so this is the current version of the cover of Mark's book, Cosmic Treasury, Seeing the Skies Through Poets' Eyes. Um, Mark hasn't told me it's officially released yet. And so when it becomes available, of course, we will be sure to tell you all about it. I'm gonna rotate here. Those of you who get uh, disoriented, I like having the landscape much better, of course. And this is the classroom. And now what I'm gonna do is walk up the same stairs we walked down earlier, and I'm going to take you to the telescope dome. So we're going up these stairs. As I mentioned earlier, we've had, a, we've had an upgrade to the lighting system here, and you can see the red lights on in the dome. I, I, I presume the dome is open, and I hope the catching everything here. Got quite a few upgrades here recently at the Cronin Observatory, and I'm going to let Samantha switch us over to Heather McIsaac. Welcome, Heather. And Heather is the London Center's Youth and Women's Program and Outreach Coordinator. And she is a, a graduate of St. Francis Xavier University in Antigonish, Nova Scotia, and Western U. And Heather's here to tell us a little bit about the telescope. Awesome. So hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the upstairs of the Hume Cronin Memorial Observatory. I've got you on a tripod, so I apologize if it's a little shaky. Um, so here we actually have our main telescope. Um, it's a little dark. Uh, I can't move it to point it to because we were actually able to find images and we will switch over to that in a bit. Um, so as Peter and Mark may have mentioned, the Hume Cronin Observatory was constructed in 1940. And most of what we have up here is still original. We have our beautiful 10 inch refracting telescope, the lens of which was actually created by the Perkin Elmer Glass Company uh, in the run up to World War II. So we're actually very lucky that we have this lens. 
uh, because the materials to make it uh, obviously got repurposed very shortly after. When the Perkin Elmer Company gave us this, um, the lens for our telescope, they also provided one of these, again, a little harder to see, um, but on the side of our telescope, we have these two 10 inch, uh, or sorry, two black refractors. Uh, and they provided the lens for that one as well. The one from near the bottom is actually a camera. Um, so when this building was originally constructed, um, there is a manual shutter right here. I can actually open, take my long exposure photography, close it, and our back room over here uh, now being used as telescope storage. If I can find the light switch, or uh, was actually a dark room. So a lot of pictures and images could have been processed while they were in here. We now have our observing assistant, Frederica. She had kept us comfy while we were uh, virtual during COVID and the kids still love her. Um, we're, again, as I say, we're very lucky to have our 10 inch telescope. It's now the largest operating find of its, largest operating telescope of its kind in Canada. Um, so although this building doesn't get used for research purposes very often, uh, we are able to still bring in outreach and show this off. Um, in the non-COVID times, uh, we'll actually open every Saturday night and bring in youth and adults from across the city for these public events. Um, again, our here is motorized. So this knob here will actually move our dome and our switch here. Um, this one here uh, controls our telescope. So even though I'm here talking to you, our telescope is still tracking, which is fantastic. Um, I'm going to wandering around now. Oh, here we actually have an image of the actor of Hume Blake Cronin uh, posing at our telescope. However, this is not the Hume Cronin for whom the building was named. Uh, the observatory was actually named for his father, Hume Cronin Sr., who was a member of parliament in the area and actually was married into the Labatt family, which, if you like to drink, you will know is a very prominent family here in the city of London. Uh, also upstairs in our dome, we keep our sidereal and solar time clocks. Uh, none of them are set properly right now because we were giving a demonstration to a group of students who came in earlier this week. Um, but we are able to use those if we want to set our telescope with our setting wheels. I am. Anything else I just forgot to mention here, Deb? Oh, yeah. So as I mentioned before, the Perkin Elmer Corporation uh, provided the glass for our telescope. And here we actually have on display some information about the Perkin Elmer Corporation. So Richard Perkin and Charles Elmer uh, worked together up until their retirements in 1950, 1960. Uh, so prior to the objective lens for our telescope was actually poured here in North America. And really prior to this, a lot of American and North American telescopes glass had actually been poured in Europe, namely Germany, France, Great Britain. And so it's, again, a very unique thing that we are able to have here in Cronin. Uh, the Turk and Elmer Corporation is actually the same group that made the lens for the Hubble Space Telescope and for the Chandra X-ray Telescope, as well as the uh, KH9 Hexagon uh, Reconnaissance Satellite. Our telescope does a little better than the Hubble did originally. Ours doesn't need glasses. So I think we win. So when we weren't able to welcome people to the observatory because of COVID, we actually got really proficient at uh, virtual observing. So here on our telescope, I'm sure when this was built uh, 80 years ago, they couldn't have imagined this. We actually have our, and as I mentioned to Tanya, we actually have a CCD hooked up directly into our uh, diagonal, which is connected down to my laptop. So I'm actually gonna sign off here. Uh, we are currently looking at Arcturus. I'm gonna switch views and we're actually gonna be able to show you what we're seeing through our telescope tonight since the weather has cooperated. So give me one second. I lied, I said Arcturus, we're actually looking at Isar. We did some star hopping while I was setting up. Let me switch cameras again. Just let me know what, are you sharing screen or do you need to switch person? 
Well, Heather is switching cameras. I'll just mention very briefly that Kirkin and Elmer Corporation was much later responsible for producing the optics of the Hubble Space Telescope. So there's a really interesting chain of provenance uh, here in the observatory. Ooh, okay, we have images here. This is exciting. Yes, so as I said, we've now switched to the laptop camera instead of my phone. And so here we have the uh, CCD image of the ISAR uh, double star. Um, it's still a little foggy, a little bright. We haven't quite been able to resolve uh, the double, but this is the type of image that we are able to get here at Corona. The sound you just heard is our dome actually shifting so that we're able to uh, continue viewing. So as you can kind of see, our seeing isn't great tonight. We've got a bit of the flickering in the different exposures um, as we kind of come in and out of ideal focus. There are some like the one we just saw there where I actually think we can start to resolve that there are two stars there. Um, which when the observatory here was constructed, we were in the middle of nowhere on the top of the hill. It was a fantastic location for an observatory as the university has built up, as the city of London has built up. Slowly but surely the engineering department has surrounded us um, and provided a lot of excess light. Um, we didn't take you outside. Um, three sides of our building are actually pinned in by either engineering buildings, the rec center, and the uh, kind of alumni hall main area here on campus. So we're a very central location, which is fantastic for outreach, um, not necessarily fantastic for observing anymore. Uh, does anyone, I guess, have any questions? I haven't been able to see the chat while I was on my phone, but about uh, the Cronin Observatory, uh, what we have going on up here. There's no chats right now, um, but feel free. Um, Raise your hand, you can unmute yourself. Ah, we're all yeah, I have Dale and Peter <laughs> are both kind of hanging off off screens. We have a lot of uh, expertise. Oh, and Marcus Cobb too. So a lot of expertise um, but from any of our presenters if people what, are- What's your diameter of your refractor? Oh, uh, the diameter of the main telescope here is 10 inches. So uh, it's 25.4 centimeters, yeah. depending on which units you appreciate. Um, the uh, focal length, uh, for those who are also looking for more stats, is uh, 4,386 millimeters. So um, we're able to crank this thing up pretty good when the weather wants to cooperate. I think my personal favorite, I think we got up to about 400 power one night uh, after we shut down a public event uh, on the moon, which was absolutely spectacular. It's almost like we were flying over the surface, which was quite enjoyable. Uh, but yeah, so 10 inch refractor. Is that much? No. Oh, no problem. Uh, thanks. No, so thank you for the first question. Awesome. Oh, Lori. Thanks. Lori. Go ahead. Lori, you're, yeah, there we go. Uh, no, <laughs> I have a new computer and it's not really working as well as I want. Um, uh, how many people can you put in the uh, in the in the dome at one time? Uh, uh, pre COVID. Pre COVID, yeah. <laughs> um, pre COVID, I think the most I've seen up here was, I think we've gotten over a hundred upstairs either between the dome and our observing deck. Um, once we hit those kind of numbers, though, um, actually, let me switch cameras. I'm actually going to bring you outside because this is easier to explain what I can show you what I'm talking about. So just give me one second as I switch which one has sound. Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, if you could switch which of me is pinned. Sorry. Um, I don't know while you're sharing your screen. I can't play around with it. I can switch which one's pinned for everybody. That's fair enough. Oh, hello. <laughs> hello, that was me again. So I just don't have an observing deck. Um, so as I step outside, and 
I feel like a celebrity because Dale is following me around with the light right now. So when I was saying we were surrounded by buildings, so this is uh, Alumni Hall here on campus, a lovely parking lot, the main rec center. Uh, this is the Spencer Engineering Building. Continue, this building actually flows in. There's, if you can see, there's a wall right here. Um, so the observatory is one of the first things you see when you like come to campus. It's right next to the main building. Um, hmm. And it's where like all the parents come for graduations and all those things. So it's a very good location on campus. Yes, yeah, so between our, if I could get Dale to just kind of show the wall and not me. So between our observing deck up here and our main dome, we probably have gotten about 100, 200 people. Once we pass that number, we'll actually start bringing telescopes down into kind of this courtyard area down here so that we can start spreading them out um, so that we don't have people lined up uh, in our stairwells, creating fire hazards, et cetera, et cetera. Um, when we host bigger events, eclipses and such, we will purposely set up elsewhere on campus so that we can facilitate more people. Uh, the solar eclipse in 26, 2016? 2017. Um, we had about 4,000 people come to campus for that event, which was absolutely spectacular, but we did purposely set up um, on the main hill in the middle of campus so that we had room to spread everyone out. Uh, it's not a big enough building to have many people, unfortunately, I wish. Yeah, um, I hope that kind of answers your question though. I kind of rambled on. Fantastic. Oh, oh, so I'm gonna turn the camera back to Peter now who's standing with me. Uh, he's gonna kind of wrap up our part of the evening. Okay, thank you very much, Heather. That was an excellent uh, introduction and visit through the dome here. And I want to say, first of all, thanks to Dr. Mark Toby and yourself, Heather, and our production assistant, Dale Armstrong, who's been holding the light all evening long with you, Dale. And <laughs> we are here on the location of the largest operating refracting telescope in Canada, Hume Cronin Memorial Observatory. And we are saying happy day for London Center's centennial. We're signing off from London, Ontario. Thank you for participating. <laughs>